In the violent storm of the French Revolution, one woman's fate stands out, and that is the Princess de Lombard. Imagine enjoying a life of incredible wealth and power just to have your head placed on a spike. What secrets did this royal keep? And why did she meet with such a horrible death? Most chillingly, what awful atrocities happened to her before this final one? In the dark corners of history, we uncover tales that send shivers down our spines. You'll find all the answers in this video, so buckle up. It's going to be a dark ride. Welcome to Tangy History. When it comes to the history of the French Revolution, we need to give you a huge disclaimer, as it's definitely not a pleasant story. This is the narrative of Princess de Lombard, only hers extends well beyond murder. The Princess of Lombard was a great favorite of Queen Marie Antoinette, which was no longer a good position to be in as the French Revolution broke out. Marie Therese Louis of Savoy, also known as the Princess of Lombard, was born on September 8, 1749, as the daughter of Louis Victor of Savoy, Prince of Carignano, and Princess Christine of hesse rottenburg On the 17th of January, 1767, Mary Therese married the Prince of Lombard in a proxy ceremony. He was the son of the Duke of Pontier, who in turn was the grandson of King Louis XIV of France and his mistress, Madame de Montespan. On the 5th of February, 1767, the new Princess of Lombard was presented at court to King Louis XV by her husband's aunt, Maria Fortunata d'Est, the Countess of La Marche. Although she was initially happy in her marriage, her husband returned to his wanton ways soon enough. After just over a year of marriage, the prince fell from his horse while his health was already weakened. His health worsened, and he was diagnosed with syphilis. On the 6th of May, 1768, he died after an agonizing struggle. The 18-year-old widow retired to the Benedictine Abbey of Saint Antoine to recover from the shock. Just two years later, Marie Therese attended the wedding of Marie Antoinette of Austria and Louis Auguste, the Dauphin of France. She was formally introduced to her later that day, and despite the age difference of six years, the two quickly became close friends. She came to serve at court, and when Marie Antoinette became queen in 1774, she was appointed superintendent of the queen's household. She did lose some of her influence when the Duchess of Polignac managed to secure the queen's favor. Contrary to the standard depiction of Lombal as a lovely but simpering idiot, the princess was intelligent as well as cultured. She was the grand maîtresse of all the French Masonic ladies' lodges, for she saw Freemasonry as a tool for creating a better world, as did many of her contemporaries. Her liberal politics were one of the reasons, according to scholar Bernard Frey, that King Louis XVI encouraged his wife towards the Polignacs and away from Lombal and her Orleanist salon. Madame de Lombal discovered before the end that utopian politics that seek to create an earthly paradise inevitably lead to social chaos. Marie Antoinette made Madame de Lombal, known for her virtue and kindness, the superintendent of her household, which was controversial at the time, since there were other courtiers who felt the position was due to them. The two women became good friends. The queen was always trying to recapture the home she had left in Austria, where she had been inseparable from her older sister, Maria Carolina, who had mothered her a great deal. Madame de Lombal and Madame de Polignac were both roughly the same age as Carolina. However, Lombal was a bit too intellectual for Antoinette, and so the queen, with Louis's approval, eventually became closer to the Polignacs. She always remained friends with Lombal. Nevertheless, Marie Therese secured positions for her brothers at court. As the hatred for the monarchy grew, both the Duchess of Polignac and the Princess of Lombal were the subject of pamphlets in which they were accused of having lesbian relations with the queen. In one, Marie Antoinette tells the Princess of Lombal, if men ever dropped us, we could not be pitied, for we know how to do without them. When the Bastille was stormed in 1789, Marie Therese was traveling in Switzerland. When she returned to Paris, she found that the royal family had been taken to the Tuileries Palace, where they were under guard. They tried to continue living by their routines, but the guards were always watching. Marie Therese left court to care for her father-in-law in August 1789, but she returned to court after the Women's March on Versailles in October. 
Mary Therese had not been informed beforehand that the royal family intended to flee in June 1791. They had said goodbye the evening before, and Mary Therese retired to Passy, where she received a note the following morning. It said that the family was fleeing France, and that they wanted to meet her at Montmédy. Mary Therese told her staff that her father-in-law had fallen ill again and set off. But while Marie Therese reached Montmédy, the royal family did not. She sent a note to Marie Antoinette which read, I wait for your majesty's command and I will hasten back to Paris to participate in your captivity. She wrote back, Remain my friend where you are. She eventually traveled to Arkham and remained in contact with Marie Antoinette who kept telling her not to return. In October 1791, Marie Therese was formally asked to resume her service, although this was in contradiction to the private letters sent by Marie Antoinette. Marie Therese, knowing the danger she was in, returned to France saying, the Queen wants me, I must live and die near her. On November 12, 1791, she was admitted into the presence of the King and Queen, and life resumed at the Tuileries. By then, many of the others in service had left, including the Duchess of Polignac. On August 10, 1792, the family were compelled to seek asylum with the Legislative Assembly, who determined that a more secure place was required. On August 13, 1792, her family was sent to the Temple, an ancient fortification that served as a prison where they could be better guarded. It was made up of two structures, a palace and a tower, which was separated into two sections, the Great Tower and the Small Tower. On August 19, the Princess of Lombal was taken to the temple for interrogation. Marie Antoinette begged to keep the Princess of Lombal with her, saying she was a royal relative. It was ineffective, and the Princess of Lombal was sent to the La Force jail. Marie Antoinette's daughter subsequently recalled, it was with difficulty that my mother could tear herself from the arms of the Princess de Lombal. Jacques-Nicolas billot interrogated Marie Therese, as well as the Dauphin's governess, the Marquise de Tourzel, and her daughter Pauline, all of whom were removed from the temple simultaneously. The Marquise later wrote, she conceived a great friendship for Pauline and said the kindest things to us every day, expressing the happiness she experienced by having us with her. However, unlike the Marquise de Tourzel and Pauline, the princess was not rescued. At 6 a.m. on September 3, 1792, jailers entered the cell and demanded their identities. They went as quickly as they arrived and Mary Therese and the Marquise began to pray aloud. Outside, an angry mob had gathered. Five hours later, the two women were led from their cells onto the courtyard. The Marquise wrote, We clasped each other's hands. I can confidently report that she had great courage and presence of mind, answering all the questions posed by the demons who joined us solely to contemplate their victims before killing them. When the September massacres broke out, killing thousands and filling the streets with blood, Madame de Lombal was urged to renounce her allegiances to the king and queen. She declined and was turned over to the crowd. She was bludgeoned and stabbed to death, and according to other versions, molested and dismembered. Her dead body was stripped naked, and her head was cut off and put on a pike. She was probably decapitated, and Louis XVI's valet, Anne Clary, also described how the mob carried her head on a pole to the temple jail for the queen to kiss. Such excesses became typical of the French Revolution, stirred up by propaganda which played upon the fears of many. The Princess de Lombal was a bit misguided, but ultimately heroic and loyal, and the grisly death to which she was subjected exemplified not only the misogyny of the new order, but a hatred of all that was beautiful and good. What are your thoughts on it? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this video informative, then hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.